when I was 11 years old, I was in seventh grade, and I put on football pads and went out for the football team, and the pads were bigger than me. Needless to say, I was one of the smaller guys in my class because I was the youngest. And I remember playing football, and I remember the only time I carried the ball in a, what you would call a game. It was actually a scrimmage at halftime of the high school game. And I remember I ran for 50 yards from one sideline to the other sideline on a reverse for a one-yard loss. I decided that football was not for me, and uh, I focused on basketball because it's not a contact sport. It's still a physical sport, but it's not a contact sport. So when you're going to play professional football, it's important that you dress appropriately. You don't see guys on the field in shorts and sandals. You know what I'm talking about? Which one in this picture is not ready to go play professional football? Can you, can you, can you find him? It might be difficult, but which one of these does not look like the other? Yeah, it's important that you wear the proper gear, that, that you have the proper pads, because it's a physical war. And Paul says in the New Testament, he says, our fight is not against the people on earth, but against the rulers and authorities and the powers of this world's darkness, against the spiritual powers of evil in the heavenly world. That is why you need to put on God's full armor. Then, on the day of evil, you'll be able to stand strong. And when you've finished the whole fight, you'll still be standing. So stand strong with the belt of truth tied around your waist and the protection of right living on your chest. On your feet, wear the good news of peace to help you stand strong. And also use the shield of faith with which you can stop all the burning arrows of the evil one. The Bible names a real opponent that we have. One that we need to be aware of. We need to take notice of. that One that we need to prepare for because it's a real and present danger of our faith. The devil. In the Greek, the word for devil is diablos. And it shares a root with the verb diablon, which means to split. The devil is a splitter. He's a divider. He's a wedge driver. He divided Adam and Eve from the Garden of Eden. And he'd like to separate you from God as well. He wants to take unbelievers to hell. And he wants to make life hell for believers. Do these thoughts seem somewhat outdated? Do you file things that are the discussions about the devil in a file folder labeled superstitions? Well, if so, you're not alone. Because according to the research group, the Barna group, 40% of Christians agree strongly that Satan is not a living being, but a symbol of evil. And an additional 19% somewhat agree with that perspective. A minority of Christians, 35%, believe that Satan is real. The remaining participants weren't sure what they believed about the existence of Satan. In other words, Two out of every three Christians. We're not talking about unbelievers. We're talking about people that say they're Christians. Two out of three don't believe in Satan. They don't believe he's a real being. Boy, I just want you to know Satan's got to be pretty pleased with this current atmosphere of ridicule and skepticism about whether he even exists. I mean, as long as he's not taken seriously... He's free to work his evil. And after all, if you can't properly diagnose the source of your ills, how can you fight them? The, the devil wants to make your life a mess. And he wants to keep his name out of it. But God doesn't let him do that. If you check out the Bible, the Bible traces Satan's activities all the way back to a moment of rebellion. 
That moment of rebellion occurred sometime between the creation of the universe and the appearance of the snake in the Garden of Eden. When God created the world, God saw that all he had made, he saw it all, and it was very good. In the beginning, everything was good. Every drop of water, every tree, every animal, and by extension, every angel was very good. But sometime between the events in, described in Genesis 1 and the events described in Genesis 3, an angel led a coup against God. And because of that, he was cast out of heaven. And Ezekiel describes this downfall. He said, this is what the sovereign Lord says. You were the seal of perfection, full of wisdom and perfect in beauty. You were in Eden, the garden of God. Every precious stone was your covering. You were anointed as a guardian cherub. You walked among the fiery stones. You were blameless in your ways from the day you were created till wickedness was found in you. Who, who could Ezekiel possibly be talking about? This being was created, was in Eden, was anointed as a guardian angel, dwelt in God's holy mountain, and was blameless from the day he was made until wickedness appeared. Who could this be but Satan? This prophecy is nothing more than a description of the fall of the devil. He goes on to say, through your widespread trade, you were filled with violence and you sinned. So I drove you in disgrace from the Mount of God and I expelled you, guardian cherub, from among the firestones. Your heart became proud on account of your beauty and you corrupted your wisdom because of your splendor. So I threw you to the earth. I made a spectacle of you before kings. Lucifer's heart became proud. He became proud. He wasn't content to worship. He had to be worshiped. He wasn't content to bow before God's throne. He had to sit on God's throne. No wonder pride is something God hates with a passion. No wonder Paul urged Timothy not to be quick to promote a new convert or he may become conceited and fall under the same judgment as the devil. Pride was embraced by Satan and as a result, he was kicked out of heaven. Jesus refers to this eviction saying, I saw Satan fall from heaven like lightning. Living in Southern California, we rarely see lightning, but if you've ever seen it, it's like a blink of an eye. It's, as, as they say, as quick as a hiccup. It's so fast, you can hardly see it. And that's exactly how Satan fell from heaven. It was sudden. It was boom, over. But even though Satan is cast out of heaven, unfortunately, he's not cast out of our lives. Be alert. And of sober mind, your enemy, the devil, prowls around like a roaring lion, looking for someone to devour. The devil comes only to steal and only to kill and only to destroy. You're, you're experiencing some peace of mind, some, some happiness in your life, and the devil wants to steal it from you. You've discovered some new hope. Maybe you've got a new job or a promotion or things seem to be going well. There's some new hope and he wants to kill it. You love your spouse and Satan would like to destroy your marriage and your family. He's the enemy of your God-given destiny and he longs to be the destroyer of your soul. Don't dismiss him. Agree with the witnesses of the Bible. From the Bible's first pages to final pages, we're confronted with an arrogant, anti-good force of great, cunning power. He's the devil. He's the serpent. 
the strong one, the lion, the wicked one, the accuser, God of this age, murderer, prince of this world, prince of the power of the air, Belzebub and Bilal. He oversees a conglomeration of spiritual forces, principalities, powers, dominions, thrones, princes, lords, gods, angels, unclean and wicked spirits. Satan appears in the garden in the beginning, and he's cast out into fire at the end. He tempted David. He bewildered Saul. He waged an attack on Job. He's in the Gospels. He's in the book of Acts. He's in the writings of Paul, Peter, James, John, and Jude. Serious students of the Bible are serious about Satan. Jesus was. Jesus squared off against Satan in the wilderness. Jesus pegged Satan as the one who snatches good news from the hearer's heart. And prior to his crucifixion, Jesus proclaimed, Now will the ruler of this world be cast out. Jesus saw Satan not as a mythical image, not as an invention of allegory. Jesus saw the devil as a superhuman narcissist. When Jesus taught us to pray, he didn't say, deliver us from the nebulous negative emotions. He said, deliver us from the evil one. We play it to the devil's hands when we pretend he doesn't exist. The devil is a real devil. But this is huge, this, this part. He's not only a real devil, but you need to know he's a defeated devil. Were Satan to read the Bible, something he would never do, he'd be discouraged because over and over again, reference after reference makes it clear that the devil's days are numbered. Having disarmed the powers and authorities, Jesus made a public spectacle of the forces of evil, triumphing over them by the cross. Jesus stripped Satan of certain victory, and he and his minions are being held on a very short leash until the final judgment. On that day, the great day, Jesus will cast Satan into the lake of fire from which the devil will never, ever return. Jesus has already defeated the devil. But be alert to the devil. Don't be intimidated by him. Learn to recognize his stench since he comes only to steal and only to kill and only to destroy. Then wherever you see heist, wherever you see death and destruction, you need to turn to God in prayer. Since his name means divider, whenever you see divorce, whenever you see uh, rejection or isolation, you know who the culprit is. It's important that you go immediately to the Scripture and stand on the promises of God regarding Satan. The God who brings peace will soon defeat Satan and give you power over him. God's spirit that is in you is greater than the devil who's in the world. God is faithful. He will not let you be tempted beyond what you can bear. Resist the devil and he will flee from you. The devil is filled with fury because he knows that his time is short. And that is why you need to put on God's full armor. Then, on the day of evil, you'll be able to stand strong. And when you finish the whole fight, you'll still be standing. So stand strong with the belt of truth tied around your waist and the protection of right living on your chest. On your feet, wear the good news of peace to help you stand strong. And also use the shield of faith with which you can stop all the burning arrows of the evil one. Football players know better than to walk on to the battlefield with shorts and sandals. Soldiers going to war, they know better than to walk on to the field 
the battlefield wearing nothing but shorts and sandals. They take time to prepare. They take every weapon into the conflict, and so should we. Every conflict with Satan and his forces, we need to take serious. And for that reason, though we walk in the flesh, we do not war according to the flesh, for the weapons of our warfare are not carnal, but mighty in God for pulling down strongholds. What are those weapons? When we pray, we engage the power of God against the devil. When we worship, we do something that Satan himself didn't do. We place God on the throne. And when we pick up the sword of the Scripture, we do what Jesus did in the wilderness. He responded to Satan by proclaiming the truth. And since the devil has a severe allergy to truth, he left Jesus alone. Satan may be vicious, but he's not victorious. As over the years working with teenagers, our youth program was on Sunday nights, and many times um, I would tape the Chiefs playing so that when I got home after youth group, I could watch the game in its entirety. And I didn't want to know the score, but there were many times where the game was a late afternoon game, and I would not be able to watch any of it, and I would come to youth group, and inevitably I remember one particular night where somebody says, hey, how about those Chiefs? They won today. And I went, oh, I was going to watch that. I knew the outcome already. So I go home, I turn on the TV, I cue it up. I knew the score. And as the game went back and forth, the other team intercepted a pass. It didn't really bother me that much. We fumbled the ball. We were trailing in the fourth quarter. The other team had a chance to win at the end, but it was no problem because I already knew who won. Ladies and gentlemen, the victory is certain. Between now and the final whistle, you will, you will have reason to be anxious. You're going to fumble the ball, and the devil's going to seem to gain the upper hand. Some demon's going to intercept your dreams and destiny. All that is good will appear to lose. But you need not worry. Because you and I know the final score. We know who wins. So next time you smell that stinky breath of the devil, remind him of the promise that he doesn't want to hear. The God who brings peace will soon defeat Satan and give you power over him. It's a battle, so we've got to be prepared. We have to suit up. Can't take it lightly, but it's a battle that God's already won. So don't give the devil more than a passing glance. The enemy's been defeated. Death couldn't hold him down. Gonna lift our voices. 